the last uh, session of the CIMAC. It is my pleasure to present uh, Dr. Juan Gabriel Calvo. He's one of the young researchers at the SIMPA. He's a doctor from the uh, current institute in mathematics at uh, New York University. And uh, he's a specialist in uh, PDEs and numerical analysis. So please. So thank you for this uh, introduction and also thanks to the organizers for this uh, opportunity. So I will talk uh, basically about two topics uh, that at the beginning they were kind of uh, separated but now I'm trying to do some joint research between these two which are basically uh, virtual element uh, methods and domain decomposition. So a brief outline of what I'm going to talk. Uh, I will introduce the problem, uh, just a simple PDE. Then I will describe some domain decomposition methods. Uh, then I will talk about the virtual spaces. And finally, uh, we'll end with some numerical experiments. So for simplicity, we will consider that one of the easiest uh, problem. Just consider a Poisson equation, uh, important. And all I'm going to talk about now, it's in two dimensions. Uh, and for simplicity, we will uh, consider also, oops, sorry, uh, homogeneous uh, boundary conditions. The usual approach is to multiply by a test function. In this case, we work in the space H01. And we end up, okay, sorry. <laughs> and we end up with this uh, a weak form formulation, uh, which is basically the integral of gradient U tested with a function B uh, equal to FB for all B in this space. This is quite uh, the standard method uh, for finite elements. So I will. Uh, talk about two principal ideas. Uh, the first one is to uh, use domain decomposition methods that uh, are based on virtual spaces. Uh, in particular, there's a, a personal interest when we have uh, irregular subdomains in the partition. As I, I will show you some pictures later. And then the second idea is to create preconditioners for the linear system that arise from virtual element methods. In general, all uh, well, these virtual element methods are quite uh, new, they are novel, they, they started like about five years ago or so. So there's no real studies about iterative methods uh, like uh, with theoretical bounds. So this is, I believe, one of the starts in, uh, of, the, of these studies in this direction. Um, a brief introduction, just uh, I did my PhD, as Javier said, at uh, Curand Institute. My advisor was Professor Olof Whitland, which he was here giving a talk yesterday. Uh, I had pro uh, interest in problems posing H coral with irregular subdomains. Uh, then I met uh, Professor Gabriel Gatica from CIMA, and in one of the uh, visits that I did, uh, I realized the existence of these virtual methods. And for me, it was a natural choice to put together with domain decomposition methods. And then I spent one year as a postdoc at the Czech Academy of Sciences, uh, where I started to develop these two ideas. And in there, I worked with Professor, uh, Professor Tomasz Beidowski. So the first idea, uh, consider that we are just using finite elements. Uh, for simplicity, just the lowest order, so consider P1. Uh, what is P1? It's a finite dimensional space where we have a triangulation of the domain. So uh, in this case, I am I'm showing a square, which is being triangulated by these small triangles. And then the basis functions are uh, just functions that take the value one at one node, like this one, and zero everywhere, everywhere else. So this dimensional space uh, is denoted by this BH, and then we discretize the same uh, weak formulation we had before in the continuous case, but now it's uh, tested only in this finite dimensional space. At the end, what we get is a linear system of equations, um, which is, a, well, it's a sparse uh, system with millions of degrees of freedom. And then uh, use exact solvers is uh, not, uh, it's not possible. So we use a, a preconditioner and use, in particular, a preconditioned conjugate gradient. So uh, for simplicity, in this explanation, I will consider just a two-level overlapping addi additive Schwarz, which I believe is the easiest one to explain. So what do we do? OK, so we are solving the PDE in, let's say, the square, the unit square. Uh, these domain decomposition methods uh, are uh, developed in order to use parallel computers. So we need to create efficient algorithms that can be run in parallel. 
Um, if, when you, I mean, the, the first idea is that you take the domain, the whole square, and you split it. Well, as you can see in, in gray, there are the elements, there are triangles, and then you group these triangles into subdomains. And if you use graph partitioners, uh, these, uh, these subdomains can be quite irregular. Okay? There are no squares or triangles or whatever. Also, uh, some uh, work in my PhD thesis, I try to consider also these kind of uh, fractal subdomains and try to develop uh, functions defined on this coarse grid. That's, that's uh, like the idea. Of course, if the subdomains are just squares or triangles, we can use linear or bilinear elements, and that's straightforward. That's like how domain decomposition is started. But then now we are interested in this sort of irregular subdomains. Uh, to give an idea of previous work, uh, basically this started about 10 years ago uh, by my advisor, Olof Goodmund, and a joint work with uh, Axel Clavon and Clark Dorman. This just three papers. And uh, as I said, I'm going to uh, talk about the overlapping version. So what do we do? Uh, we have the domain, we decompose it into, we group the elements into different subdomains, and we create overlapping subdomains, uh, as shown here to the right. And then we have the subdomain in blue, uh, and we add layers of elements and the boundary. And then we denote the original subdomains by omega i, and the overlapping subdomains by omega i prime. We will consider, uh, of course, every subdomain has uh, uh, a smaller number of degrees of freedom. So we will consider homogeneous Dirichlet problems in omega i prime. And then we have local spaces denoted by vi, which are basically the restrictions of H01 on the overlapping subdomain intersected with the finite element in space. Uh, we can define a natural zero extension operators, which basically take these functions uh, from the local space to the finite element in space. And we use exact solvers in the sense that we will consider this matrix AI hat tilde, where uh, simply this uh, matrix is just a block of the stiffness matrix A that corresponds to the interior nodes of the overlapping subdomains. This is made locally, so as I just said, uh, I, we will have all these overlapping subdomains all over around, and on each one of these subdomains we will solve a problem that of course can be done in parallel, okay? because all the subdomains are independent. What is important here is uh, how we define the preconditioner. So the additive version is this equation given here. The preconditioner is a sum of different solvers. So this sum from one to n are the local solvers on each one of the overlapping subdomains. But if the preconditioner includes only this part, then it turns out that algorithms are not scalable. As we increase the number of subdomains, the condition number deteriorates and the number of iterations of the solver uh, increases. So it's always necessary to define a coarse component, uh, like a coarse function that uh, takes care of communicate everything that's going on on the subdomains. So let's suppose for a minute that we have a coarse space V0 defined in the coarse grid that is uh, composed by the subdomains, and that we have an extension operator from this coarse space to the finite element space. So again, if we use exact solvers, meaning that I define A0 uh, tilde like this, this is the action of the preconditioner, which clearly can be uh, developed quite easily in a parallel uh, setting. So the big question, again, is how to define B0 and this R0T, okay? Uh, so what was done 10 years ago by Wiedlund and, uh, and all their colleagues is that basically you take the decomposition, like here, and you obtain the subdomain vertices, which are in red. So subdomain vertices are the nodes that belong to at least three subdomains, okay? And then for each one of these uh, nodes, you define a coarse function in this uh, coarse grid, basically. Uh, and then the coarse space is the span of these functions. And what, what they did, basically, is to define values on the interface. And the interface are all the nodes that are here in black. So somehow you define, for example, for one red dot, you put the value one in that red dot, then you put zero everywhere uh, on, at all the other subdomain vertices. And then somehow you define the values on the, red li uh, on the black lines, and then you use discrete harmonic ex extensions. So basically what you're doing is creating uh, functions that have minimum energy uh, in the H1 uh, seminar. Uh, but it turns out that these discrete harmonic extensions are expensive to, uh, to obtain because you also need to invert the matrices that correspond to each subdomain. Uh, turns out that for these uh, studies, 
the condition number of the preconditioned pre system is bounded by these factors. This is like the usual bound we get, meaning that we have linear growth in the uh, relative overlap. Here, capital H over delta is uh, the relative overlap of the partition. And uh, here we have the logarithm of capital H over little h, which essentially this is the number of, sub of uh, nodes that we have on each subdomain. So uh, basically saying, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot, this constant C is also uh, independent of the number of subdomains and of capital H, little h, or whatever. It only depends on the as aspect ratio of the subdomains. So in general, we expect uh, a scalable uh, algorithms if we do this. So the idea, the first idea that I mentioned, uh, this is quite simple. Instead of using harmonic extensions, use the virtual element space on the coarse mesh, which somehow seems natural, since in this coarse mesh we have polygons, okay? Uh, so what are virtual elements? Uh, here just a, a list of the, I believe, first uh, studies on this. This is, well, this one has, are from 2013. And mostly this work started with uh, Bresci and Beira da Vega and all their colleagues. Um, so again, if we have a partition, then the idea is how can I define a function in this irregular coarse mesh, okay? Uh, just to show you some examples of, uh, these are typical uh, partitions obtained by a, a graph partitioner software called Metis. Uh, I will show you okay, later on other pictures, <laughs> sorry. And then how do, we, how do we define these visual spaces? Well, uh, we uh, take K as the degree of the approximation of the space, and for any subdomain we consider this space. VK on the boundary of the polygon is basically functions that are piecewise uh, polynomials of degree K on each uh, E, where E represents any edge of the boundary. So we put the boundary conditions uh, in this space, and the local virtual space essentially are functions uh, that satisfy these uh, boundary conditions. And plus, we include that the uh, Laplacian of B is a polynomial of degree k minus two. So in particular, the lowest order case, which is the one that I'm interested in for defining uh, coarse spaces, is V1, uh, which are essentially piecewise linear functions on the boundary of the uh, subdomain, and that are harmonic in the interior. Okay? Important here, the degrees of freedom are the values at the vertices of the polygon. Okay? So if you think, if you have triangles, then of course you will get P1, uh, okay, there's, not, there's nothing in there. But the thing is that if you, if you have, for example, a pentagon, then you have five nodes, you have five degrees of freedom. In this space, you have, of course, the polynomials one, X, and Y, but there are two other functions that are never computed explicitly, and this is why they are called virtual, because you know they exist, but that's all you know, okay? We only work with the degrees of freedom. Uh, so, as I said, this is the global space that we consider. Uh, functions that the restriction to each subdomain are virtual. And then the degrees of freedom of the global space are the values at the vertices of the, polygon, of the polygonal subdomains. Again, the values in the interior of the subdomain are not known. Basically saying that if I have this polygon here, the degrees of freedom are the nodal values on each node, but in the interior, I don't know what's going on. And the problem, if we use this coarse space, is that the dimension is the number of all the vertices of the polygons. So for example, in here, each one of these nodes adds to one to the global, to the dimension of the global space. And why is that a problem? Well, because in parallel implementations, of course, if you have a coarse problem that it's too big compared to the local preconditioners, then you have a bottleneck and it's not uh, scalable. So what do we do? Instead of using, it, in, instead of considering here a degree of freedom for each one of these uh, nodes that are in blue, we construct a coarse function for each subdomain vertex. So instead of considering this, for example, in this green subdomain, instead of putting a degree of freedom for each one of these red nodes, we consider only degrees of freedom for the subdomain vertices, which decreases significantly the size of the space. And how do we do that? Well, we prescribe uh, the degrees of freedom on the interface. If I am removing these two, these two red dots, then I will impose some condition in those nodes uh, as, I show in, uh, as I show H, as I show here, okay. So uh, how these course functions look? Well, let's call it uh, CX0. 
where x0 is one node of the partition. So we set phi to be zero at all the subdomain vertices, except that x0, where it takes the value one, quite similar to what we have in if, uh, these p1 elements. If the vertice is not an endpoint of a coarse edge, then the function will vanish on that edge. And if the edge has endpoints x0 and x1, then we consider a unit vector in the direction from these two endpoints. And then we set the value at this node given by this. Might be weird at, at first, but it's quite simple. It's just like a linear function that decreases linearly from one endpoint to the other one. Okay. And if the projection over DE is negative or positive, of greater than the length of the, of the edge, then we set the function to be zero or one, respectively. So we have an uniformly bounded uh, function. And it is clear, well, as I said, that it's between zero and one. And if we add all these coarse functions, then uh, what do we get is uh, one, okay? which is quite important because then it reproduces uh, constants. Okay. Oh. So again, the, okay, oh my God, okay, there you go. Okay. So this is the coarse space that I will use. What is next is defining the extension operator that goes from the reduced coarse space to the finite element space. So in here I have written two different ideas. I, in, in this talk I will talk about the other one. This one is just, uh, has been submitted uh, where we construct this uh, extension operator by considering piecewise linear interpolants. Turns out to be enough for what we need with a similar bound uh, for the preconditioned system. Here I'm going to talk about this approach um, which was recently uh, accepted in math mathematical models and methods in applied sciences. And what uh, will we do is to construct it by computing projections to polynomial spaces of degree at least two. Again, here we don't need uh, harmonic extensions, which saves computational time by a big factor. I will show you some uh, plot later on. And again, we can prove theoretically that the condition number of the preconditioned system is bounded by this. So somehow it's a generalization of what was done before, but now without harmonic extensions. Okay. So what are, uh, as, uh, it's important here, uh, you, uh, you will see later, that the degree that we use to project has to uh, have degree at least two. And then when we talk about virtual elements of degree at least two, the local space, spaces, of course, are, are similar. What change is the values of the degrees of freedom. So in this case, uh, the local degrees of freedom for each polygon are the values of B at the vertices of the subdomain. The values of B at K minus one internal, point, internal points on each edge uh, in order to uh, be able to interpolate the polynomial of degree K on each, uh, on each edge. And finally, we have some interior moments given by this, which are basically integrals of the virtual functions time monomials M, which are a scale and are taken by this. Uh, the monomial alpha is given by X minus the body center over the diameter of the subdomain. So these are the degrees of freedoms that are used to construct these virtual spaces. So how do we project from the virtual space to the space of polynomials? Well, this is basically what is done. Uh, we consider the abelian form as before. We restrict it to omega i. I denote it by a i. And then the projection of a virtual function will be denoted by b hat. It's a polynomial of degree k that satisfies this condition. So basically the gradient of B hat times uh, the gradient of Q is equal, well the integral of this is equal to the gradient B gradient Q for all Q in uh, polynomials of degree K. So basically we are saying in a weak sense that the, the, uh, that the gradient of the virtual function is equal to the gradient of this polynomial. And in order to take care of the constant part, we consider this average saying that the, the average of the uh, polynomial is the same average as the virtual function which is given by this. Here it's important to mention that this value is one of the degrees of freedom of B, so we can compute this integral exactly just by knowing the degrees of freedom, okay? So how do, how do we compute this, this projection? So we need to solve this problem essentially, okay? And it may, it may seem weird because I'm integrating the gradient of a virtual function which we don't know. But turns out that we can do that exactly basically because if I take a polynomial of degree K and a virtual function in BH, when I compute the integral of gradient of, pay, of P and gradient of B, 
by integration by parts, we obtain this. And turns out that the first integral can be computed exactly because this is given by the moments of the virtual function because the gradient of pk is a polynomial of degree k minus 2. And the integral on the boundary can be computed also exactly because the normal derivative has degree k minus 1, bh has degree k, so all this function has degree 2k minus 1, and we know the value of the function at k minus 1 interior nodes. So if we choose these nodes as gauss lobato uh, quadrature nodes, for example, we can compute this exactly. Okay? So this is the way that uh, P, uh, the projection pk is constructed. Okay? In particular, <coughs> so how do we define the extension operator from the coarse space to the finite element space? So we have this reduced space that I mentioned before, that it's a subset of, of the coarse virtual space, which is also a subset of higher degree uh, virtual spaces. So if I have a function at B0R, then I can uh, think of this function as an element of this uh, bigger space. And if I want to see this function as an element of uh, degree of, of the space of degree k, then all I need to do is to compute the internal degrees of freedom. I already know the function on the boundary, so I compute the nodal values at all over the boundary. But then I have to uh, s uh, compute the moments of this function u0, which at uh, first it's not possible. Okay? Turns out that it can be uh, computed by solving a small linear system in each subdomain. So for example, if we are using spaces of degree 2, then basically this is just one equation that we need to solve to obtain the moments of this new function of this function seen as an element of a higher degree uh, space. And then finally, we can express the extension operator, uh, the restriction to each subdomain, like the not natural interpolant onto the um, finite element space of this polynomial, which we can evaluate at the interior. And then we add this sum, which is basically the difference of the values on the boundary minus this projection. This, in simple words, is saying that on the interface, I keep the same values of the virtual function, which I know, and in the interior, I, in, I approximate it by this uh, polynomial. Okay. Uh, some uh, numerical implementation uh, uh, details. Uh, what, how do we do this? Basically, we construct a matrix, let's call it D, uh, that it's uh, the number of vertices times the number of monomials where the entry pj is just the degrees of freedom of the scale monomials, so this is quite easy to compute. Then we have this matrix B, which is uh, formed by these uh, inner products of gradients. Again, this can be computed explicitly because this is a polynomial and this is a virtual function. And these p0s are just uh, averages, the mean value of, uh, of each function. So this can be done easily. This is perhaps, uh, I, I'm going to talk about this quite fast. Uh, basically, uh, we have an operator in a matrix form that acts from the virtual space to the polynomials, which can be written in terms of, of B and D. Uh, if we consider the local matrix AI in, the, in this form, where this I stands for interior and B for boundary, then we have all the entries that are in the interior, interior with boundary, and so on. We split the projector matrix as P1 and P2, where P1 corresponds to the uh, nodal values on the boundary, and P2 corresponds to the interior moments, and we do the same with the degrees of freedom, D1 and D2. Uh, remember that if I'm talking about this course function, I have degrees of freedom on the boundary, which I, then I group into this D1 vector, and then we have the inter interior um, moments, which I don't know, that are denoted by D2. And then we end up, uh, let's put it, let's skip all this stuff, and, at the end, we have this linear system, which is the one that I was talking about. So from here, I solve for D2, and this gives me the moments of the virtual course function, uh, seeing as a uh, subset of a bigger uh, degree of space. And then once we find D2, the degrees of freedom in the inside are given by this expression, so uh, everything, as you see, is quite uh, fast to implement. It turns out that if we use this course space and this extension operator, we have this bound, uh, again, I showed it before. Uh, it depends on logarithmically on the number of uh, degrees of freedom on each subdomain and the uh, relative overlap that we are using. And again, this C is independent of H, and capital H and little h. And just to show you a 
a plot of why I think it's uh, important is that uh, the original approach that uh, came up 10 years ago uh, used a discrete harmonic extension, so this is the time required to build only the ex uh, extension operator R0T. And if we use uh, spaces of degree two or three, uh, you can see that the time is quite better. Here in the x-axis, we have the uh, square root of the number of degrees of freedom, roughly speaking. So it's quite uh, significant. And just to show you how a course function looks like, if we have uh, these four subdomains, so here in the discrete harmonic uh, function, I have a function that is one in this vertex and zero at all the other vertices. And this is the discrete harmonic uh, solution. If I approximate it by piecewise linear polynomials, we get something like this, which is not very good. And if we use quadratic and cubic uh, virtual element spaces, then we got something like this. Uh, and again, as you can see, for example, here, well, perhaps the scale is not quite clear, but as you can see, it, like this light blue is zero. Dark blue means negative. So we have here some sections where the functions are negative, uh, which are basically uh, because we are approximating, we are using here an approximation of degree two. But as we increase the degree, we, are, uh, we obtain better approximations for the discrete harmonic function. That's, that's like the goal. So just to uh, discuss a few important ideas of the proof uh, briefly. Uh, in there, you need to use a discrete Sobolev inequality, which basically says something like this. The infinity norm of a virtual function is bounded by this. Uh, okay. I won't go into further details, but this is used. Uh, then we have this lemma, uh, where we can bound the H1 seminorm of the projection and the L2 norm of the difference by these nice expressions. And here it's quite important, again, that the degree K has to be at least two. And this is basically because of the fact that we use a Poincaré inequality at some point. And this only works uh, if we have uh, functions with zero mean, uh, zero mean value that cannot be computed if k is equal to one. Because we only, if k is equal to one in the virtual space, we only know the nodal values and there's nothing we can do. Um, another important idea, uh, again, this one is related, this lemma is related to the extension operator. Again, we compute the L2 norms and H1 norms of these expressions. This is quite, uh, uh, not difficult, but quite long, so I won't, I won't discuss it any further. And the general idea in this uh, additive uh, preconditioner, it's quite simple. You have a function u, you split it as a sum of terms, uh, ui, that belong to the coarse space and to the local servers. So you define u0 as some interpolant into the uh, virtual coarse space. You define some local contributions, e, ui, which are in vi. It is straightforward to verify that this is splitting sums uh, to the original function. And it is well known in the domain decomposition theory that the condition number of this is bounded by this expression. And then all we have to do is to find this constant c, which is basically a constant uh, that says how the energy of all the pieces is bounded in terms of the energy of the whole function. So I'll show you some numerical experiments uh, just to give you an idea. So I have discretizations with P1 and Q1 elements and I use preconditioned conjugate gradient up to a tolerance of 10 to the negative six for, as I said, triangular and square elements. Uh, and in here, this first slide is for triangular elements. So the first part of the table shows scalability as I increase the number of subdomains from 12 squared to 24 squares. Uh, here I have four columns. So the first one uh, is for square subdomains. This is what has been done uh, by Whitlum before, just to compare uh, the new results. So this is the number, the, 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 this is the dimension of the coarse space. Here I2 represents the number of iterations required when you use a, polyno a space of polynomials of so degree two. And in parentheses, you have an estimate for the condition number. So when we have these irregular subdomains, we do the same. Uh, of course, the number, the, the dimension of the spaces will increase because we don't have this nice uh, structure of squares. So these are the uh, dimension of the um, coarse uh, spaces. And as we increase that degree, for example, here the degree is two and the degree is three, we see that uh, the, con the number of iterations uh, remains essentially bounded. There are small variations. And the condition number also remains uh, unchanged, basically. Uh, Important to mention that condition number of the original matrix is of order one over little h squared. So there is a significant reduction in the uh, 
condition number of the matrix. And this last uh, column is the harmonic uh, case, uh, which again, just to compare how well it behaves. And as we expect, as we increase the degree, we get a better approximation for these harmonic extensions, but of course this uh, saves time, as I said before. Uh, this second test uh, is uh, just to observe what happens when we increase the number of degrees of freedom per subdomain. And again, we see, uh, well, I'll, I'll, oh, sorry. We see a, logarith a small growth. It's supposed to be logarithmic, uh, so we see in general this growth. And the last uh, example shows something similar. But now when we consider a discontinuous uh, coefficient distribution, uh, meaning if we are solving the divergence of some coefficient times uh, the gradient of you. Okay. Um, for square elements, we have a similar, uh, a similar behavior. So I will skip this, perhaps. Okay. So that's, uh, again, this is like, let's say, half of the talk. Uh, but don't worry, I'm about to finish. <laughs> um, so what we did here, again, just in a simple sentence, we have finite element um, discretizations. We can use, we can define functions on these polygons, so polygonal subdomains, and create nice preconditioners. The second idea uh, is well, what happens if you don't have, in general, the finite element uh, discretization, but you discretize precisely in the fine mesh with virtual elements. So just to show you an example, you can have a grid like this and then you can discretize the PDE that I will show how you do it in a few slides, and then you can obtain like, this approximate solution. Um, again, we can use, for example, I will show examples with hexagonal elements, so here we have a grid full of hexagons, and you can have irregular meshes, and just something that I found uh, quite funny <laughs> is that when they started to make some experiments, this uh, mathematician, Alessandro Russo from Italy, he started to make uh, some a grids formed by this Pegasus uh, shape and turns out to be uh, quite robust even though we have these weird uh, triangulations. So how, how do you discretize? Uh, we cannot use the original bilinear form, we need to modify it. So there is this uh, new bilinear form AH which is basically defined on each K, on each element K, that now it's any polygon. And this local bilinear form is basically the original uh, AK uh, evaluated at the projection on the space of polynomials, but then we need to uh, include an stabilizing term, which can be uh, of the difference. Looking at here, we have U minus the projection, B minus the projection. And this SK can be chosen as uh, simply as the sum of the degrees of freedom of the functions on the boundary. This uh, is the set of nodes, so basically you evaluate the function on, on the nodes of the polygon, and then you add up all these contributions. Um, it can be shown that uh, this new bilinear form satisfies uh, these two important things, consistency, meaning that uh, this approximation and the original bilinear form are the same whenever we test with polynomials, meaning that we can recover polynomials exactly. And this stability property that, the, that basically says that the new bilinear form is uh, uniformly bounded by the original bilinear form. Okay. With that, you can prove that the system is uh, uh, that the um, linear system has unique solution and so on. So. And just to show you some examples, here uh, this is what happens when we have an hexagonal grid. Uh, and again, uh, I use uh, here I only show approximations of degree two, but again, as we increase the number of subdomains, we see like a bounded number of iterations and a bounded uh, uh, condition number. And again, we have these irregular elements. These irregular elements were constructed by, from a Boronoi diagram, uh, diagram, so something like that. And uh, again, we see like a nice behavior. And uh, this is again the experiment where we increase the number of subdomains. So again, we see nice behavior in the condition numbers. And finally, the effect of what happens when we I increase the overlap on the uh, subdomains. So uh, here in the x-axis, we have capital H over delta, and the condition number is in the uh, y-axis. So these three points, for example, correspond to the case that we only add one layer of elements to construct overlaps. And of course, as we increase the overlap, the condition number decreases. Um, as expected, it's supposed to be linear. We are getting nice approximations. And just uh, what I'm trying to do in the near future 
is to generalize this problem for 3D uh, cases. And in 3D, uh, there is a, I mean, the, the main difficulty is that when you have these irregular subdomains, you have a, a huge number of faces, uh, faces on the boundary of the subdomain that are not uh, planar. Uh, so you need to define uh, projections for each face. And computationally, that's quite expensive, or, or, or at least in my, in my implementation. Uh, I would also like to apply it to different PDs just to uh, s s observe the effect of these domain decomposition solvers. And in, I have particular interest in problems posing H curl and H deep, so eventually I will move on there. But, but I think that's it. Thank you so much. Back away from the horses, keep going back. <laughs> now this is the first part, so I don't know how long I should I keep I'll, going. I'll let you know, I, I forgot what you were calling that. Just keep going back. Okay. Right, right there, right there. Right Here. There. there you go, there you go. Uh, uh, this is quick ha har harmonic thing that you were talking about. So if, if you were to try um, with higher degrees, I'm, I'm guessing that it's gonna get closer to that discrete harmonic, um, Function in, that you were trying to. It's. I, I haven't tried higher degrees because essentially in the numerical experiments, k equal three, it's almost exactly as in the iterative solver. The results are quite similar. Uh, of course, the time will increase, but I, I wouldn't expect to be the same because uh, basically the discrete harmonic extension is uh, when, when you do that, you are solving a local problem with as many degrees of freedom as the subdomain. In the case of approximations, you, you just solve a small linear system of size k times k minus one over two. So for instance, if k is five, then you're solving a linear system of 10 equations, which is nothing. Okay. So it should be, I mean, it will increase slightly, but not significantly. Okay. okay. I have a question on the, um, when you have this additive preconditioner, mm -hmm. Um, this coarse grid operator, is it distributed among all the processes when you, com when you, when you do it in parallel? Um, basically, in order, okay, let's put it here, okay? Yeah, exactly so, that. Way. Okay, basically, uh, this matrix uh, operator has columns which include the degrees of freedom of all these coarse functions. So you can uh, assign to each processor one subdomain, construct the restriction of the course function in that subdomain, and then just take it back and form this matrix, basically. Uh -huh. So, but then. So, so the construction of the matrix can be done in parallel, is it? Uh -huh. Yeah, but then this thing is a global object, so uh, at some point you have to close, you have to call a kind of all gator or something like that. Yes, 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 eventually you need, yeah, in the preconditioned uh, conjugate gradient, you need to apply this preconditioner, but yeah, eventually you need to to call all the information. So and this, this is exactly why this thing should not be so big. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because the other ones are what's called embarrassingly parallel. This yes. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Okay, thanks. As, uh, as I understood, you are doing BEM to avoid the discrete, I mean, the harmonic extensions. Yes. But um, by doing BEM now, you have to project. Yes. So how do, do, do you compare the, the computational cost of, of both the al alternatives? I guess, uh, is still BEM cheaper? Yes. Faster? Yes. yes. Can, can it be, be proved, I guess? Uh, yes, well, I, I, but Yes, I've seen uh, these things experimentally, but, but yeah, virtual, I mean, to construct these projectors, you only have to integrate, uh, basically, essentially. Um, for the discrete harmonic extensions, uh, basically you are solving a new PDE on each subdomain, so uh, let's, I mean, it's cheaper for sure. But, but I haven't done like b uh, really big implementations, so, 
So that would be nice to see like a, how, how uh, you accelerate this, uh, how, how you save uh, computational time, basically. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, we thank uh, Juan Gabriel Calvo.